Hopefully that is rocking. Yep, looks like it. Okay. Uh, let's kind of get going here. How's everybody doing? Everybody doing all right? You got had a good couple of weeks, I take it? Check one, two. Everybody there? Yep. Okay. Great weekend. Yep. Awesome. Okay, well, uh, we might as well just kick right into it here. Uh, obviously, this is going to end up being part B of the first session that we did on immersive and we kind of uh, picked up this conversation right toward the end where we were talking about uh you know all the fill concepts for immersive versus uh the other uh you know formats of pa etc so i thought we'd kind of you know whip through this again let's do a little bit of comparison again uh you guys saw scott come into the room so i'm really glad he's here he's going to help uh you know kind of validate some of the things i'm saying and answer some questions probably as many for me as they do for you because, uh, you know, the whole concept of doing fills and uh, for immersive and subwoofers for immersive is pretty interesting because uh, it's definitely situational, but it, you definitely have to think a little differently when you're doing it. So, uh, sorry, I'm just doing a little more, letting a few more people in here. All right, so let's get going. Uh, we'll have just a really quick review here. Uh, so last week we talked about comparison, uh, comparing all the different uh, formats of PA systems, uh, mono versus stereo versus LCR versus immersive, and kind of the pluses and minuses of all of that, right? The trade-offs of all of those. Uh, so uh, where we ended was just kind of getting toward fills and subwoofers. So if you remember it, we had this, this was the criteria used to uh, compare all those different formats. We're not going to go through that criteria uh, comparison again today. We'll get through this uh, relatively quickly. Uh, but just remember, this was the criteria that we were used for the comparison previously. And then, you know, this is kind of how it all shook out, uh, you know, just kind of, you know, kind of driving home the concept of trade-offs, right? You know, no one of them is perfect in any situation. Uh, it's all a little bit situational, and uh, you just got to pick the best balance of your trade-offs to pick which format you want to use. Obviously, there's all kinds of things that go into that even deeper than what we talked about, but... Those are certainly the ones we discussed last week. All right, so let's talk immersive fills and subwoofer concepts. Let's try to do this again. So <clears throat> we're going to start back at mono again and talk about, um, you know, how we do extension of coverage and, uh, you know, fills for mono. And, you know, uh, actually, hang on one second here. I got a wrong slide up. Stand by one second. Sorry there, I was doing a little editing this morning and got a duplicate slide in there. All right, so what we were saying was for mono, and typically in a, you know, a big mono system, uh, you know, doing extension of that coverage and extension of that signal is not too difficult, right? Uh, we're just literally in a big center fill. Uh, we're just extending that out for delays, uh, and it's pretty easy. You know, we have to have a lot of manipulation of time there. Uh, although if we, you know, if we get these kind of things equidistant, we can we can use one time there, but uh, it requires the actual physical spacing to be accurate on all of the fills. Short of that, we can just we can do uh, discrete times there and get this pretty phase coherent uh, for the entire space. This is actually pretty easy to do. Uh, but once we, or actually once we get to front fill, you know, the same thing applies, right? If we're going to do mono um, fill down there, that again just becomes that downward extension of that big, you know, mono fill or mono main PA system that we have up. There's no sense of localization here. This is all just time back to a central source. Uh, so it's, like I say, it's, it's relatively simple to do uh, given all the trade-offs that we talked about last week. But once we go to line source here, this is going right, then it gets a little trickier, right? Uh, in terms of extending the coverage of that line source, right? We wouldn't necessarily want to build an arc of line source there right above the center. And more often what I've seen is people will do something along these lines where they'll put uh, extension clusters out uh, to the sides there. 
Uh, the same principle applies for the ground fill. Obviously, we're just extending uh, coverage down there, and you know, it all kind of works out fine. Uh, but once we start doing the uh, the delay fills, then again, we don't necessarily you know need to do one for every array. We can certainly, but it would make me feel good about making music. It would make me want to die. And uh, I, I yeah. mute your mics if you haven't. There we go. I'll get you. And, you know, it's just a, an extension in terms of time. Again, it's just, you know, discrete times, same signal kind of going everywhere, and it's just amplitude and time adjustment to get that right. So, uh, again, not too difficult in that situation. It's not a lot of, not a lot of criteria or a lot of decisions need to be made there. All right, so as it says here, M1 and M2 and M ground uh, all require dis discrete time manipulation, right? We need to have discrete times on them to get them back to that center source uh, and uh, you know that's that's the main goal there now it gets a little trickier as you'll see here when we get to subwoofers right so in the subwoofer situation you know i i've actually been involved in some designs uh, where there's been a lot of discussion of how best to do this i, I see this a lot uh, in arenas, you know, for sports, etc. Although it may, maybe now is the take the time to, to make sure and re, uh, redefine our context here. Uh, really, everything we talk about today, uh, guys, and I don't mean today in terms of uh, the decade that we're in. I mean in this hour. Everything we're going to discuss in this hour is really uh, revolves around doing this for music presentation, right? For live music presentation. This is not sports arenas. This is not theater. Any of those kind of things that are so much more situational than what we're going to be even talking about here today. So keep in mind, we're in a pretty narrow context here. We're looking at this strictly for live music production, okay? Mute your mics, please. Mute your mics. Thank you. All right, so uh, as this, in this situation here, you can see that uh, we have subwoofers flown directly behind each array, which is totally... Uh, a legitimate thing to do if you want to do it. Uh, but you can also make an argument that uh, what is better served here, especially in a big format, in a big arena, is actually a center cluster of subwoofer and that because you're all you're delaying this all back to a single time source anyway, right? Now, the argument that I make sometimes uh, versus this is that with the center subwoofer system, we're actually creating one, impulse and kind of one arrival time for the subs no matter where you are right in this situation you're creating three different sub impulses out into an acoustic space right even if they're timed back at some point there's different arrival times for all those arrays depending on where you are in the arena and that's not as much the case here so again it's kind of situational you might be able to do it here you might not be able to uh, i've had situations even though we're talking about uh, music here, you know, if you want to go back to the arena for the sports, you know, sometimes the scoreboard would inhibit you doing this kind of center array thing, so you have to go back to the other. So, but in terms of the alignment, it's pretty simple, right? We're going to create one subarray there, or we're going to create three subarrays timed back to each other. Same kind of uh, thinking for the ground fill, right? We can always go to the split left right stack. I think by now we all know the downsides and the, the challenges that come with doing that. Uh, you know, in terms of horizontal coverage and all the nulls that we create and do that. So, you know, something we see a lot more often today is a distributed uh, ground system. Uh, I think in either of these systems, I would always kind of recommend you do complementary band passes here. I wouldn't have them necessarily overlapping band passes here uh, where you might, you know, have a specific band pass for the flown and a specific band pass for the ground and have them crossed over. All right, so I'll, this, that's kind of what the little paragraph is implying here, that sub F and sub G, sub F being flown, sub G being ground. Uh, you know, they require discrete time manipulation. You can do some pattern control in this uh, if you want to, you know, create cardioids or create arcing, all of those kind of things. Those are all just trade-offs against efficiency. Uh, whether we want to admit that sometimes or not, I see guys that don't seem to want to admit that sometimes, but once you start arcing, once you start doing cardioid, you know, you can, can actually affect the efficiency pretty dramatically of your entire subsystem. So, you know, figure out what you want to do there and make sure you're applying the right metrics to get it done. All right, let's see. What do we got next? Okay, let's talk about fill support for stereo, right? Our big left-right PA system. 
Uh, in this situation, you know, a lot of times, uh, at least this is what I've done in the past, I'm just extending that left coverage and extending that right coverage. And I, you know, I'm maintaining some mix integrity by not putting anything that's critical anyway, very far wide left and right. Uh, you know, it's kind of, as I described to Scott, I think last week, it's more of a wide, mo or yeah, a wide mono uh, as much as anything, but you do have placement capabilities with it, right? You have the, the ability to have things in the center, out to the left, right, create some space really as wide as you want to do it. Uh, in terms of fill, more often than not, we'll see mono front fill for this situation. Very rarely do people put down, you know, a left and right uh, stereo fill here. And kind of the same thing for the uh, delay. You know, most often uh, delay is done as a mono fill out in this situation. Now, it's not to say you can't do it in stereo, uh, but, you know, obviously it gets trickier in terms of drive and all kinds of things. Uh, but even in these situations, I would even recommend, you know, discrete times for all of these mono sends. You want to be able to get that thing coherent uh, in the critical listening zones of any one of those fills or delays, right? Uh, we won't go into the concept today of what you're delaying that front fill to. I, we, I've, I've actually covered that in a previous lab. If you want to go back and dig it up, you know, whether you're actually taking that front fill and delaying it to the PA system or you're delaying it to the back line sources, uh, I'll let you guys go back and re-examine that lab if you want to have that discussion, uh, etc. Don't forget, you can chime in at any time with questions if you want to tunnel down on any of this at any point. We can stick around here, so uh, we're not on any kind of time limit or here if you want to, want to discuss. Oh, sorry. So this is uh, that concept of actually using stereo out in the far field, right? So we can do stereo out in the far field for the... Uh, for the delays, it's it's totally effective. Uh, it's just a matter of whether you want to do it, whether you want to fly the topology out there to do it. You can also do the same thing for ground fill. I've actually done this in the past. Uh, I think I did this on almost all of the Matchbox 20 tours I did. And I, I really, really liked this. You just had to get the positioning of it right. It had to, it had to each of the left and the right ground arrays had to sit in kind of a sweet spot uh, in terms of alignment down there. And I, I basically, you know, aligned this to the back line, and it was a, basically two PA systems, a ground PA system and a flown PA system, and I sacrificed uh, the overlap zone out there to make the front field uh, much more coherent for the, the close listeners here. But this was actually very effective. I did this for a long time. All right, so the flown arrays are in full stereo, as it says here. The ground aways are in mono, unless you want to do them in stereo. Uh, you do have to have discrete delays on them, whether you're going to uh, delay it to the PA system or to the back line. Either way, same thing for those distant arrays. You have to have discrete time manipulation on those to get them in the proper uh, alignment. All right, let's see what we got here. Okay, so let's do some reverse image stereo or some distributed stereo. I, I see a lot of guys talk about doing this. Uh, I'll just be frank with you. It's something that I've never been a fan of. I've tried this on a couple of occasions uh, and never really liked it where you have both left and right on one side and both left and right on the other. I, the only time I ever did this uh, and thought it was effective uh, was doing it in the round. When I, when I did some of the stuff in the 80s in the round, we did it checkerboarded, you know, left, right, left, right uh, to the four corners of the stage. And that seemed to work pretty good. You created four zones of stereo. And then the corners of the arena, you know, essentially got uh, one side. Uh, but again, that, that was not really a true, I mean, there wasn't anything really, really big stereo going on there. Uh, and there was certainly no sense of localization because people were running in circles uh, for the whole show. So, you know, localization was not an issue there. But I have seen this work. Uh, and I, I think my probably my biggest challenge with it or my biggest issue with it is that it, essentially makes the acoustic field mono, right? I mean, when you're standing at the console, especially if those offstage fills are of any amplitude to compete with the, you know, the long portion of the hall there, then your pan pot acoustically kind of becomes irrelevant. You know, you can pan something left and it actually goes both directions in the room. Uh, it, it creates ambience on one side and direct sound on the other. So it's, it's kind of a weird, weird duck. I, I tried it, I, I think for a short period of time and then just I finally just said, no, I'm going to go back to full stereo and I'll just manage it uh, at the mix of what I'm going to do here.
So uh, in terms of um, flown fill, you know, delay fill and front fill, if you're going to do distributed left, right like this, then I would definitely suggest, you know, mono fills uh, for that kind of thing. You know, you, and really, again, whether you're doing it to the back line or to the, uh, the PA system, I, you know, that's an argument for another day. But uh, you want to have d discrete times uh, on, those, uh, on those fill systems. All right, so flown arrays are, are in acoustic mono, essentially. Ground arrays are in mono. Delay arrays are typically mono in this configuration. All right, let's see where we go from here. Yeah, let's talk about subwoofers in this situation. And we'll just leave it at traditional left, right here, right, where we're uh, discrete left and right. So obviously everybody's seen us do this. We're going to do flown subarrays behind uh, or near the main arrays. Uh, and obviously get some good phase through crossover uh, with those two arrays and, and have it be really, really good. Uh, but we're also going to add subwoofers. And again, we'll just, I know this is going to be a little bit repetitive because some of these are the same, but obviously you can go to a left right stack here and keep this pretty coherent vertically. Uh, but you have all of the comb filtering capability or possibility in the horizontal domain. And, you know, to make sure we're all saying the same language here, that horizontal comb filter is there for the flown arrays as well as the ground arrays. It's not just something magical about ground arrays that give us that horizontal comb filter. That happens in those flown ones as well. So, uh, you know, that's, again, that kind of drives back all the way to our original discussions last week of why this is so unique in large scale format PA systems where we have, you know, the possibility of cancellations all the way down into the subband, even from the left, right PA because of the spacing, right? Because of the distance that they are apart uh, they are susceptible to that comb filtering that's happening there. So, you know, what we'll do sometimes is, uh, a lot of times is actually do distributed subwoofers, uh, you know, and create, and we, again, we can create arcing, we can create cardioid, whatever you want to do here. But the idea is to, you know, clean up that horizontal response of at least that ground system so it's not so apparent uh, when, we're, uh, when we're walking left to right or, you know, hanging out left to right, right? We want to get that as clean as we can possibly do it. And then probably uh, the best, best results I've ever gotten with this, if I'm going to do flown and ground, again, is to do complementary bandpass, right? Where the ground system may actually do, you know, a lower section of the frequency response than the flown subs. Like give them their own piece of the sub band to do and the alignment is easier. They don't conflict with each other out in the acoustic space, et cetera. You know, you can... You can get away with a lot more if you do that uh, in those systems. All right, let's talk about some LCR. And, uh, you know, last week we were talking about 100% divergent LCR, so we'll keep it there for this discussion as well right now. Uh, in this situation, obviously, we've got separate signals for the left center and the right. Uh, remember, the big advantage there is, uh, you know, being able to... Uh, create localization, try to offset some of that comb filtering between the left and right because there is no center information being created by the audio out of the left and right. They're more discrete. Uh, anything that is pan center is only coming out of that center array. Uh, but in this situation, if we need to expand coverage around there, it gets a little trickier, right? Then it almost you know, demands that you move back to 50% you know, divergent where if I have something pan center, it's going to all three arrays equal energy there. Uh, so in that situation, you're almost commanded to do that uh, in order to get around the sides there. Although I'm going to talk about an alternative here that I've, I've been kind of pondering for a while now. And, uh, and immersive has made me think this way. So let's talk fills here, though, for a second. So in terms of delay fills, you know, uh, here we can create the image again. Uh, extend that imaging out into the far field. That's not a problem. We can do that very effectively here. And again, we can do this regardless of whether it's 50% divergent or 100% divergent. Uh, I don't think I would run separate divergences in far field versus near field like that. I think I would keep it the same. I would want those to be the same. But obviously, you ha have to have discrete times on all of those drives uh, out to uh, those systems. Okay. So let's talk front fill now, I think. Yeah. So the times that I've been out with LCR, uh, even when I was doing it 50% divergent, uh, 
Uh, I would actually recreate the LCR image at the ground as well because I was really trying to create localization there as well. So, you know, the keyboard player that's on the, on the house left would actually appear there in the PA system, whether it was flown system or ground system. So I, I, try, I, I did that and uh, felt very successful with doing that. I really liked doing that piece of it. Uh, if we were going 100% divergent there, then it puts a little more pressure on that center coverage. You have to have some wider center coverage in that ground system if you're going to go 100%. Uh, so, you know, in, I, I never did that in the LCRs that I did over my 10 or 15 years of doing it. Uh, I was just doing, you know, standard arrays across the front there, but primarily because it was 50% divergent, right? All right, let's talk about, uh, yeah, so I'll let the paragraph read out there and I'll grab a drink. All right, so let's talk subwoofers in LCR. So really, same kind of concept, really identical concept to stereo for all intents and purposes. Uh, although I, you know, I might do this a little differently given a situation I'm going to bring up here in just a second. So same sort of thing where we want to get rid of the splits on the floor and do a little more distributed. You know, we'll sacrifice maybe even a little bit of efficiency there to be able to do some distrib distribution and some uh, some better horizontal coverage. You know, that's that feels like a good trade off to me to sac, especially as powerful as subwoofer systems are today. To sacrifice a little efficiency there to get some better horizontal coverage seems like a good trade. So, same sort of deal there. So this paragraph reads essentially the same as the one in stereo. How are we doing so far? Is this making sense to you guys? Is this uh, is there any revelations for you so far? Man, you guys are a quiet bunch today. You must have must have partied hard on the weekend or something there. Or maybe I'm going nowhere here. <laughs> All right, let's talk you about... Know, I, I was applying some of this to, uh, you know, either full stereo with delays that I've done. It, for me, it's mostly been corporate since I've been thinking about it. But uh -huh. we've had clients that wanted a full stereo down a whole ballroom. So we had full stereo, five delay rows deep. And... Yeah, I, and I've that, mixed on that, honestly, and it yeah, that can pretty, work. It, yeah, it's pretty cool. You know, the thing about, I was thinking is, a lot of that has to do with, or uh, in the round type examples, uh, or partially in the round, is creating at least movement, if not, you know, more than localization, just so you can get people kind of, you know, altering their space a little bit. Yeah, it, I think in the far field, I'm not as worried about localization as I am just spatialization, so to speak. And, and I don't mean that in the strictest sense that we'd use it today. But, you know, just getting some things out of the center and getting them off to the sides a little bit can make it a little easier to mix it, you know, live. It just you're not so tied down to that concept of stacking a, a lot of instruments and voices in a, in, you know, kind of front to back there to get them to read, you know. All right, let's see, where are we at here? All right, yeah, we're gonna talk about, oh, this is what I was gonna talk about, yeah. So, you know, kind of given what I've, <laughs> I'll say learned, I guess, is or discovered in the last little bit of time here over, you know, uh, dealing with immersive, uh, th certainly through talking to people like Scott and, you know, uh, I saw Hugo Laren in the room today talking to him about how spatialization works and as well as other people. You know, it really made me start thinking about how I've done LCR in the past. And I think, uh, you know, this, as I'll say here, you can kind of file this under hindsight. I think if I had it to do all over again, I might go back and do LCR differently than I had done it in the past. Because uh, I think we could probably deal with some of the situations that I've dealt with, the challenges in the past. So it basically would look like this. If I was going to use Anna to do this, EAW Anna, I think I would try something like this and see how it works. Meaning, you know, a more powerful center array that is equal in terms of height, et cetera, probably to the left right array. But the wraparound arrays on the outside, I think I would make mono. And uh, I think that would give me the proper amount of coverage, but also give me the, the right amount of discreteness LCR down the main throw of the room, right? This would be 100% divergent. So, 
kick, snare, bass, vocals is all in that center array. So I, it's all dreamland right now. I have no idea whether it would work, but from the experiences that I've had with LCR in the past and just the experiences I've had so far with Immersive, this feels like this actually would work really, really well. Uh, so I, whether it would or not, I don't know, but it's that's kind of a dream time for me. I would like to go out and try that in some setting. So I think it might work pretty good. I think in this situation too, I would probably even do it as LCR and, well, I would probably just do it as, as pure LCR here and let the, you know, some of those middle positions like the left center or the right center positions be a function of addition between the C and the L or the R, you know. We would still have some, uh, you know, some, some phantom imaging there, so to speak, to create that positional uh, aspect of it uh, between the LC and the R. So you, you would be subject to a little bit of comb filtering there, but uh, I still think given the we've cut the distance, the overall distance dramatically there between uh, any two arrays that are going to have the same audio, I, I think it might actually work pretty good. All right, let's let's uh, let's move on here. Where are we here? Okay, so now we're going to jump to immersive and hopefully this will be the meat of the discussion here today. Uh, so as uh, Scott was kind of talking about last week, you know, uh, when you have something spatialized here, obviously spatialization is only going to work truly for a piece of the hall, you know, where you get that the, the really good localization, the really good acoustic phase because of uh, elements only or objects only exiting one, primarily one speaker system uh, at a time. So the question becomes, well, okay, let's talk about all the rest of it now. How do you do fills? If we're going to do an arena, rock band in an arena, so to speak, how do we get around the corner and what do we do with it? What signal does it actually get? Same thing applies for the front fill, right? If we're going to do front fill, well, what signals go down there? Are we going to create a spatialized environment down there as well that is as discrete as the flown? You know, these are all questions that need to be answered. And then in terms of far field, what, what examples or what situations in the far field are going to exist where we actually want to spatialize, right? I mean, depending on the situation will tell you kind of whether you can actually get away with spatialization or not there, right? So let's, let's talk about it here. So, you know, the shows that I've seen in this configuration are actually using a mono fill out to the left and right to expand coverage around here. And this is a folded down version of the spatialization it can and from what i understand i i'm not going to speak with absolute authority here because i ha have enough experience with it maybe scott can chime in here on it but you can have the choice of either folding this down into mono or what is commonly referred to as far as i understand it a spatialized mono uh, it's still a mono signal all of the objects are exiting that speaker system but there is delay and uh, amplitude matrixing going on within that feed to give those elements the right placement that is relevant to what's happening in, out in front of the system, right? So as opposed to a flattened mono, which would just be all of those signals added together and you know shot right out of that mono system. So a little more care is taken in terms of time and their amplitude in relation to the immersive when it's coming out, this spatialized mono, which sounds very appetizing to me. That, that feels like the right thing to do there. So uh, maybe, maybe I'll just bring Scott in here and maybe he can talk, help talk through this. We'll go through the next few little bumps and slides and then I'm going to turn it over to Scott for a little bit. Hello, hello. Can you hear me now? Howdy. Good to have you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, you're kind of spot on with that. Like um, there's two primary challenges, of course. We've got this beautiful frontal system um, covering, let's say in an arena situation, maybe 60 or 70% of our audience, but there's still a good third of it that's off to the sides yeah. and objective one always has to be um, objective one always has to be coverage, right? That's the first thing we have to do. Um, and that's a, a definitely a challenge to begin with here. Hold on one second. <laughs> Scott's got competitors in the background there. Sorry, we're gonna, <laughs> I got him on a day off here. <laughs> Sorry about that. That was a, a seven year old uh, desperately needing a juice box. Let them chime in, man. Yeah, we, exactly, we need to exactly. know what they need to think as well. So. Um, so that's, I mean, challenge one is just coverage, right? So let's, let's just say mono objectively fills that fine. 
right? Um, and then the second thing we can do is exactly what you're elaborating to, which is how do we ensure it is seamless to the system in front? Um, so that's where we can apply different time signatures to the different feeds that feed it. Um, and that can work and it does work in certain situations and it's probably more relevant in some than others. Um, where there's very little overlap between what will be your fill zone and your main zone, it's probably actually not that relevant, right? Um, where there is maybe a lot of overlap that's more relevant and where there is um, also a wide visual image, it's more relevant. So as we get further and further away from a wide visual image, if we're, if we're thinking about pairing these together objectively um, in terms of visual and audio image, from the side, the, the visual image is a tiny sliver. So it's, it's not nearly as relevant as it is in front. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll give you some you know, practical experience with this. When I, 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 again, I'll harp back to this uh, show that I went to see with Lord at Oracle Arena in Oakland. That was my first real experience uh, with big immersive. And, and I, you know, I had the freedom to go walk the entire room. I was really curious to how it was going to play out. And I went over to the sides where one of these offstage fills were. And I, I'll be honest, I didn't realize there was an offstage fill. They had it very well hidden. I was looking. It was dark. I, I couldn't see it. But I remember standing off to the sides there. And I just could not get past the idea that her vocal, like her image, like if you would have asked me, where is that vocal coming from? I would have absolutely pointed to the center array of speakers, the center main array of speakers. I would have said, that's where it's coming from right now, even though it wasn't. It was it was that spatialized or maybe it was even folded down. That was that, that was that was a perfectly flat mono. Yeah, but that's yeah. a that's an example where. It's, it's as you pointed out, it's easy or relatively easy to extend the coverage of a mono system, right? Because yeah. we're not dealing with a lot of complexity. Um, and in this situation, it was um, that side hang, the fold down was timed to the arrival of the center array. Yeah, it makes sense. I, I mean, I, right. I'm not kidding. I stood there for 20 minutes, scratching my head, thinking, how the heck are they doing this right Well, now? and the funny thing is, is you don't lose all the spatialization because remember your perception awareness as a listener is, is dependent on two functions, which is arrival time and the loudest thing, right? So if something arrives first, you can actually have a fairly different amount of amplitude um, difference between the next arrival. So, you know, let's say six, seven, eight dB, the thing can come later and be louder. But as long as that first arrival is first, you still pull to that. And yeah. Yeah. so if we use your example on screen here, Robert, your house left, uh, mono fill if we if we're standing over on the, the little gray or a uh, brown box there you know maybe you hear the center just two milliseconds ahead of that fill system mm -hmm. but the amplitude or the power is coming from the fill system but you'll still perceive it all day long coming from that array then it'll actually be true for all the arrays that are closer to you and all the ones that are further won't be true for because they'll actually be behind the signal mm -hmm. and so if you think of the guitar player on the right array that energy would also be coming from the monofill, but would arrive uh, much later from the original source. And so it'll totally disappear to you. And so the, the part of the mix that is far away will collapse. That's okay as well, because your visual image is small and you won't really perceive that as a problem. Um, so on Lord, that was purely a mono. And, yeah. and in fact, for most large scale arena type situations, we're still maintaining that because there's not necessarily a huge advantage to go to a time blade spatial fill for that. Um, because you don't get any spatialness. You're just getting a, maybe a moderately better alignment on some signals. So on a really big system, it's going to be helpful on a arena size, questionable. Um, yeah. it, it might or might not be but, advantageous. But no situation. harm in doing it there, right? No necessarily harm. No, not at all. Um, it, the, only, the only issue you ever get into is, um, has anyone here ever run a delay really fast back and forth on something? <laughs> yes. Okay. So if you have an object that goes from left to right, it's maybe got an LFO running on it. So it's giving you that nice effect. The LFO in the front will sound fine because there's no delay applied to that motion across those five arrays. But in the spatial field, we actually have to ramp up and down the delay that's being rendered there. And so you'll actually hear that, that, you can hear that tearing if it goes fast enough. Right. So that's the uh, that's the challenge, right? Because it's the worst case scenario of applying uh, delay smoothing because you're at a 90 degree to the motion. So um, we have to apply 20 meters of, of delay addition and then 20 meters of delay subtraction every, I don't know, 
two seconds if that LFO is moving around, you know, with a you know quarter of the the tempo or something like that. Um, so that could be a problem, right? That could be a, a challenge that it appears in a spatialized system with delay smoothing. Um, and there's three ways to tackle that that have been done on by the the world as a whole, the spatial world as a whole. One is to um, uh, uh, smooth the motion so don't let it move as fast um, uh, or to limit the amount of delay that can be applied in that action right so um, and you'll see that you'll see sometimes where things just can't move real fast in certain environments because of of delay trying to smooth um, this isn't the case in Eliza in all of the primary systems but it would be in any of the spatialized fills that are doing any delay gain matrixing yeah yeah that makes sense that yep makes sense. so it's a challenge all right. Well, let's uh, let's jump to front fill here, right? So, uh, same sort of challenge here, I think, uh, which is, you know, do we do a flattened mono down here, or do we do a spatialized mono, or do we do we just do a duplicate of the L L C C R C R down sure. here? You know, so I I gotta believe to some degree it's situational, but I I'm interested to know your like what you guys have been landing on, Scott, for guys that are doing this. I mean, this is where I think spatialized makes the most sense, right? Um, because you're down and you have a wide perspective. In fact, you have the widest image of anyone in the venue. Correct. If you think of it down there, if you're sitting row three, I mean, you're holding your hands out 120 degree wide is the stage width or more. And so if you can give someone spatialization down there, that's actually really advantageous. The second thing is when you try to create spatialization in with gain and delay, you need to have at least three arrival sources for it to be really effective to create the localization information. So if you want to create that, I go, hey, I want to feel like it's coming from the left. I need to hear three different speakers perceive the, produce the same thing at different gains and delays. I'm going to then perceive it left versus right. Um, and so basic rule of thumb here is uh, if you want to spatialize fill, you need to have the minimum speaker separation um, or pardon me, the maximum speaker separation be equivalent to the minimum listener distance. So front rows at two meters from the stage, six feet, speakers can be no more than six feet wide. Right, so that's that's your rules. That's easy-ish to do in front fills. It just costs more in terms of DSP amplifier speaker. Um, the good news is, if I were to equate Robert, if your last tour we took the front fill speaker and applied that to the audio percentage of budget a show, it's probably not a huge number. So if that number gets a little bigger, it's probably not noticeable by most. If not all. Well, that kind of brings up another point here that uh, that's probably worth digging in on. I mean, given that, like, if we're doing how do I even want to verbalize this? If we're collapsing down essentially those five cents to those five main arrays into that mono fill or even those front fill, I mean, do they need to be bigger? They need to be bigger, right? I mean, they need to have more power handling capability, that's, I would think. That's the funniest thing in, in, in all of this. And it's the thing that no one conceptualizes until they do their first show and they don't do this right which is all of the fill systems that are not spatialized, even if they're um, like a spatial fill, like a spatial monofill is ultimately still producing all the signals in it. Um, all of those speakers actually have to have the power equivalent of the sum of all of the primary parts. Right, right. So if anyone here likes their uh, Excel sheets, it's 10 log of number of arrays. So 10 log of five, if I recall, is something like uh, 7.5 dB. Um, uh, uh, and the challenge there is is that now my front fill has to have 7.5 dB more power as compared to the signal at any given array. So if you use your, pardon me, your, your center array as the reference and you say, oh, I want my lead vocal to be X loud, you need to have at least 7.5 dB more headroom on top of that so that when you put the bass player in LC and the keyboard player in RC and the whatever in L and right. And when all of those are getting pushed towards their limit, the head, there's still headroom in the fill. Um, and so what you'll end up with a lot of the times is a very robust looking front fill and a very, very um, uh, robust um, uh, outfill, right? So that's, that's, definitely, uh, that's definitely a challenge right there. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's, that's definitely something you, gotta, you really need to consider um, the other interesting thing is to think about the energy utilization based on music of a spatialized system. So this is something we've done extensive research on, and we've actually taken a power analysis of the amplifier output capabilities of each source in the system throughout the duration of the show. 
and you can think of the the output as a bell curve based on distance from stage, right? Or not even a bell curve, a curve, pardon me. So all the arrays in the center are used a lot. And as you go further and further away, the actual power need is less. So um, that's good. That tells us obviously how much headroom we need on our fill comparatively to the size of the system and, and starts to really hone that in. But, but definitely, um, uh, uh, that's definitely something to, to think about. Um, I saw a couple of questions come in, Robert. I don't know. It looks like you're answering one of them there. So yeah, uh, specialized mono or a uh, uh, mono flat mono can come from the council on L acoustics land, Elisa land. We can also derive it from the processor if desired. Um, one of the advantages to that deriving from the processor is it applies the gain attenuation that's functional based on dip depth. So if you use the 3D part of the mix and you go backwards, it'll track that, um, but doesn't inherently have to be. Um, uh, and you can also derive the mix down range. So this is kind of an interesting part of spatialized mixing, but let's think of a show, maybe a, we're in an arena show with unlimited budget and we have surrounds. Um, we might not want to put the surround information into the front fills, right? So you could do that on the Elisa processor. You could also do that, of course, on a council and do it as an ox feed, something along those lines. Um, so that would be like two ways to do that, but it's something you have to think about is it's not a full mono. It's actually only a mono of objectively certain information that I want to put into this said speaker. Right, right. So you, do you have the ability to filter that uh, in the Elisa processor? Yeah, you can you can define the mix down range. So yeah. you can define your, you the processor inherently generates a mono LR and an LCR mix down, and you can define its range of use. So, hey, and let's just let's just keep this to the stage. Exactly. Yeah, that range is, is geometric, right? Correct, it's, it's polar, yeah. It's, you yeah, define polar. a yeah. plus or minus, you know, 45 degrees or whatever you'd say. All right, groovy. Well, let's see if there's anything else. Uh, well, you know, I actually see another question that's probably worth uh, addressing here from Winston, uh, talking about what what is the alignment procedure, you know, spatialized versus mono. I mean, do you even do you even ever consider aligning to the acoustic sources on a stage in this situation? I mean, you can, but they're not going to be stationary a lot of the times, right? I mean, I guess like a drum kit's stationary, but how would you do that to a lead vocal if that's your primary objective since he or she is moving i would assume well it's it's not i mean in those situations the criteria for aligning to the stage is you're, you're picking the most uh uh the most damaging amplitude on stage and aligning to that you know and then letting the rest ride right so yeah i mean the good news is like for me i've always felt in most situations the front fill line that i, I do towards pa because if that damaging thing is reasonably far upstage it'll then be early which will mean my localization information will come from it. Yeah. That only becomes problematic when the time difference between the damaging information and the PA is 20, 30 milliseconds, then it's annoying. If it's five or 10, you're, you're kind of in an okay spot. Yeah. Um, to answer this question specifically, I've, I've done um, L acoustics breaches. My same scenario here is, is alignment reference array is center, right? So in that case, my front fill aligns back to that. If I'm doing a pure flat mono, then each one of my, front fill taps will be referenced back to that point. Um, that seems to work pretty well. Um, if it's a spatialized fill, it's done in the processor. So then the processor, you put the geometry in of all the sources and um, you have an offset ability, but uh, but effectively you're just letting the processor handle the arithmetic of the alignment of each of the maybe 10 or 15 front fills to the five or seven arrays above the stage. So then do, do those front fills, Scott, do those actually show up uh, in the Elisa processor as yeah, individual exactly. units? Yeah, exactly. And, 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 then, and then you have to define their their source of information. So we can define that group of speakers as the source is the stage or the scene, as we would call it. And we can choose to add other things. So um, that would be scenario if, if your next slide happened to be delays, then you could choose for the delays, for example, to have um, surround information in it as well. If this was a theater, for example, exactly. Yeah. Um, so you could do that. Um, that'd be a pretty expensive way to do it, but um, you surely could. Um, at a festival, I might not be keen on that, but I might be more so in a theater since we're... I, yeah, you awesome. and I have talked about this in the past. I, I think certainly in a theater environment where the geometry is pretty narrow anyway. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, there's a good chance in that situation, if you're doing immersive, people under the balcony are going to be completely shattered out from the immersive array. Yeah. Where if you could support that under balcony, that might make sense there, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and that, that, that's totally where I think a spatialized delay system makes a lot of sense is, yeah, is, yeah. is in a theater environment or a corporate environment where I can continue that on further and further back. It's a, it's an expensive thing to do, right, in terms of 
you know, objectively I could cover this area with five speakers and now I need to do it with 11. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it used to be five speakers on three DSP and amplifier. Now it's 11 on 11. Right. So <laughs> it's, it's a bit different in that sense. More is more. Yeah. That's all right. Uh, see, Angelo, I see your question on workflow for channels to output DSP, et cetera. If you can hang in there, we're going to get to that right at the end of this conversation. And then that will almost be the conversation in total for the next lab. Okay. So, uh, hang in there. We'll address that as we can get to it. Okay. All right. Let's see here. Uh, so yeah, I think I was, you know, I, I threw this in there as well. It, where I think you were given the example of maybe a festival or something where you're not going to try to uh, do full immersive in the far field. You would just go back to standard mono. Yeah, there, I, right? I, I think so. I mean, when I think of, you know, doing a Coachella, we've already got 15 delay towers out there and that's mono, right? Um, right. To go to uh, something reasonable immersive where, you know, we're not going to 20, we're going to 50 or 60 delay towers. Um I don't know that there's a palette for that, nor do I think it's relevant. I yeah, mean, I think when you're 200 meters back, the stage is, even though it's a huge stage, is only taken up five or six degrees of your visual panorama. Um, spatialization is not necessarily the first thing that is relevant to me there. Um, it might be more interesting to do surrounds if that's your show and have that cash register bounce around uh, <laughs> even for the surround people. That might be more interesting than a spatialized front system. Yeah. Um, but I think that's production dependent. But I, I don't see that as the most obvious production win in that scenario sure would be fun to play with i'm looking forward to it i'll, I'll be the first one to help design that with you guys if anyone <laughs> wants to do 50 delay towers um, and the most i've done is 37 sorry so um, i'm looking forward to that nice all right let's see uh well let's talk about subwoofers we'll get right to this here uh let's see here have i done this right yes so I haven't used any automation here. I've just you know thrown the subwoofers into the system here. So I think the, at least the systems I've seen so far, you guys are using combinations of ground and flown subsystems, right? Does any of like the, the deployment of that kind of jive with what I've you know, kind of portrayed earlier in this presentation in terms of, you know, band passes, signals, et cetera? I mean, you guys, you guys doing similar yeah. things here? A little bit of, yeah, absolutely. I think there's some validity to all of that. Um, one of the interesting challenges you have, um, so first off, I mean, everyone in the room hopefully agrees that mono subs are the best. And, and in fact, if we could get it as close to a point source as possible, that's the best. Um, there's a, you know, you, you brought it up earlier. I think that's a great point. There's a bit of an unwritten, um, not unwritten, there's a bit of a misunderstood uh, disadvantage of certain sub designs, right? A sub arc is beautiful in terms of its coverage and it's pretty inefficient in terms of its abilities that's not necessarily a big deal as you said with the powerful subwoofers we have today except the fact that uh, uh, losing 10 db or 6 db a sub is doubling the sub count or tripling the sub count yeah. right and it's not uncommon to go to a live event and see a inefficient design of subwoofers in the order of 6 to 10 db that's that's actually unfortunately very common um so if we can do it mono, that's great. Um, one of the neat things we have is effectively, let's just think of this at the most simple way possible. A spatial system is trying to create a bunch of mono sources. So if we can keep the alignment of those mono sources all really well, life is grand. So option one might be to have a subsource with each of those arrays. The only challenge there is each of them subsources have to be capable of producing the energy of your single loudest instrument, say your kick drum or your bass guitar. And that means a lot of sub. Um, the second thought is you can't, in a large scale system, put like the the bass heavy instruments, which are generally rhythmic instruments, um, very far apart from each other. So it's not really feasible to do that just from a pure time of flight thing. You run into temporal issues in the, the audience. So they almost unequivocally end up being centered around maybe the, the center 10 to 15 meters of the stage or the center three arrays ish. Um, so that becomes easier than to place your subs and time it uh, just in the middle. So that's what we've effectively done. Um, the one downside is now if you fly the subs up with the arrays, this is great for time alignment. Everything is well aligned. Everything is impacting. You have good time signature everywhere. You have good summation everywhere. That's all wonderful. You actually have really good coverage as well. Um, you can make the arrays tall enough so you don't have too much energy on stage. That's great. Um, uh, the energy cancellation on stage is, is consistent. That's great. Um, the, the only downside is for the people down front, they're missing impact because your subs are now 20 meters away above you as opposed to right in front of you. Yeah. Um, and you're below a vertical array, which means you're starting to get vertical directivity. Um, 
And the last thing, and this once thing people forget is the uh, uh, reflected image or the source image from that flown array. When you're standing up on a concrete floor and you're a six foot four tall guy, um, the wavelength of the impact, um, it, completely cancels for you when you're right down front because of the bounce off the ground. Um, so you actually get a bit of a reflection from that and that causes a bit of a, a, a notch or a, a down blow. So I do front fill subs as well, but they're really front fill subs. They're to fill in the first 15 rows or so. Um, and then that's just a, a, a sub arc, if you will. So I'm willing to trade that efficiency for that. And I do do a different band pass as well yeah. um, because the PA has that same issue when you're below a large vertical line on a concrete floor of a notch. So I allow the front subs to go up to 100 or 110 hertz, whereas the, the flown subs, um, uh, I, I don't do that. They're only doing maybe up to 50 or 60 really to do the infra base. Right. Uh, the LF right. come out of the PA. So I do that same thing. Um, that doesn't really help a, a timing issue at all. You still have an interaction between them. So you'll find, you'll have one interaction node that will kind of wrap out um, uh, as an arc, maybe 10, 15 rows out. Then you'll play with that balance of turning up and down the front fill sub and playing plus or minus three or four millisecond to see if you can mitigate that. But ultimately you're just pushing it forward two rows or behind two rows um, where those two will fight each other a little bit. Um, but that seems to work really well. Yeah, it's fun. I, I, subwoofers is always really fun, and, and I mean the math just works so good down there. And <laughs> you, it's I easy mean, math. If you if you make mistakes, it's so so obvious, you know. So it's fun. Well, and it's obvious and it's forgiving, right? Like I think yeah. people tend to forget that you can change a sub timing by four or five millisecond. It has a negligible impact on most things. And so sometimes it's like, hey, let's under time it here by three, four, five milliseconds. And that's a huge benefit somewhere else. Right. Because at plus or minus 90, five milliseconds is not a big deal. But at plus 90 to 180, five milliseconds is a huge deal, right, right? Uh, in terms of phase response. So you can, there's, there's a lot of play there to, to, to get away with. Um, but you'll see most spatial systems are doing um, uh, 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 either, um, if they can fly at a flown center sub, um, uh, and then the B plan is usually a big sub arc. You're just having to trade efficiency and then alignment, right? You yeah. have a vertical issue and you have an efficiency issue. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. All right. Well, Scott, thank you for coming in again, man. I really very much appreciate you contributing here. You certainly have, uh, you know, you have this whole thing kind of dialed in and nailed. It's really great. Nice to have you as a resource here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, anybody got any questions before we move on here? We're going to dive out of, take our first dive out of speaker systems and kind of set up what we're going to talk about in the next lab here. So I'll just watch the chat. Uh, you're welcome to come in with a live mic if you want to ask a question too. That's fine. Address. All right. Okay, so I think we're going to move on here. So let's talk about uh, the next, we'll set up for the next thing. Our, our next session uh, in a couple of weeks is going to be on object-based mixing. Uh, but before we go to that, I want to just kind of lay the groundwork here a little bit in terms of the kind of the players that are out there, how they're doing this, uh, you know, how people are actually achieving this kind of spatialization technically and with the gear they're using. So let's just kind of get into this. Oh, I'm sorry, we need to do this as well. I'm sorry, I forgot my wrap up here. I think I got it out of time here. So consideration, so all fill situations, front fill, side fill, off stage fill, really all of it is situational, right? You're gonna pick uh, and match it to your situations. Uh, things that can impact this are rigging, sight lines, physical space limitations, and actually what you want to have showing up in this mix. Do we need it to be spatialized or flattened? Uh, how does it address competing on-stage sources? You know, all of that needs to be taken into consideration. We don't just want to throw up a speaker and say, there it is, go at it, boys. You know, I, we want to have some, some technique and some agenda when we do this, right? And I, I would say that's not just for spatialization. That's for any situation with PA. Uh, in terms of localization and imaging support, uh, do I need to support the main system format? We talked about that right toward the end there. Uh, is it a flat is flattened mono acceptable? Certainly there are situations when it is and is spatialized mono preferable. And of course, there are times where that is as well. So hopefully we've given you some things to think about and some things to dig on, dig in on if you want to find out some more information on this or if you're considering this for your designs. You know, I know there I, I'm starting to see this, you know, immersive systems crop up in a lot more churches now, uh, which I think is a really applicable place for it. I think it's a, a fantastic uh, solution for 
you know, these big fan shaped churches uh, where they were doing this. Uh, and, and we'll talk about the other reason I think it's a good example or a good uh, fit for those kind of places. And that is the implementation of it and how you mix to it. I think it actually makes mixing to it a little easier in that situation. All right, so let's carry on. So these are the players uh, that are currently doing this. Now, th this is obviously not everybody. Okay, I'm sure there are other companies out there and doing this. But these are the kind of the main players, right? So we see DMB Audio Technic, uh, Elisa from L Acoustics, uh, Spat Revolution from Flux, uh, Timex Sound Hub. Time, the guys in Timex have been doing this kind of work for a long time now in theater. Uh, Meyer Sound is now using Space Map Go in conjunction with Galaxies to be able to do this. Uh, Dolby Atmos, of course, uh, you know, a lot of the mixing concepts, a lot of the object-based mixing concepts have emanated from the Dolby workflows. Uh, and they're coming up with, the, and they may even have it now, their own hardware renderer to be able to do this. Uh, Astral Spatial is another one that is out there that is very popular. A lot of companies have adopted this to be able to build and design spatialized systems using their own PA components. And then, of course, Clang is out there, uh, and it's being kind of deployed. I think it's inside the digital Digico consoles now. They've partnered up with them to create a, a spatialized mixing environment in ears, right, uh, for monitor mixing, which is also another place where spatialization could be really, really cool. You know, it's a nice, a nice workflow there. Okay, so. Given that we've got all of these players, there's also a number of different ways that they're going to implement it. Uh, and I've, I've just kind of taken my stab at kind of parsing these things out and talking about the way that people do these, the way these companies are doing it. And I've kind of broken it into three piles, kind of. There's a turnkey system pile, which is the DSP, the speaker system, the amplification system. All of that can be packaged from one manufacturer, really optimized to that manufacturer. Uh, and then the second uh, swim lane is DSP hardware, right? So DSP hardware means there's just a DSP spatialization dedicated piece of hardware that you can use with your own speaker system. You can pick the speaker systems you're going to use with it, uh, et cetera, and design your system accordingly. That kind of falls under the confines of these three manufacturers out of there. And then, of course, there's DSP software where you're going to take a computer and through software, it is going to be the spatializer. You're going to have to hook up I.O. devices to it, get input and output through it. Uh, but the, the computational skill uh, or abilities of the computer is going to be put to use to do the spatialization. Now, I mean, let's, let's talk apples to apples here. All of these devices under the hood are computers. But some of them are purpose-built. Some of them are not, right? All of the turnkey systems are going to have purpose-built DSP hardware to be able to do this. Same thing in DSP hardware. Those are going to be purpose-built devices to handle the spatialization. In DSP software, that is going to be purpose-built software running on a multi-dimensional computer that can do all kinds of other things as well. But we're, you know, we're just harnessing the power of the computer to do the spatialization. And there are plus and minuses to all of these. Okay, So uh, from my mind, that's kind of the three swim lanes of deployment and how they look. Uh, let's talk about control now. How do we take control of these devices? And because uh, as, certainly as the mixer or a system engineer, we got to be able to take uh, control of these devices. Maybe it's real-time control while we're mixing. Maybe it's offline control when we're pre-building. All of these things have to be taken into consideration if we're going to operate here. So the first one is uh, application browser, right? Uh, and the vast majority of them will use application browser, right? We'll see a lot of companies that are using, uh, you know, just like a browser window to get into their DSP and take control of that. They'll have a software application, maybe a dedicated software application, but it's all a similar style of control via remote computer. Uh, we also have OSC, uh, which is open sound control. Uh, this gives consoles or outboard equipment the ability, maybe, maybe if it's even an outboard computer, to take control of elements within the DSP processor, right inside the spatializer. Uh, in those situations, maybe a console or another computer uh, that's running audio or whatever can dictate movement of objects within the spatializer or placement of objects in the spatializer. Uh, that's all open sound control. Uh, very common language to be able to do these sorts of things. 
And then the final one is plug-in control, right? Where we actually have a plug-in uh, that is running on the console at maybe at the channel level that allows us to manipulate an object on the console inside the spatializer, spatializer right? So we have some remote control of that spatializer at the channel level uh, by a plug-in. So I, for my money, I've kind of parsed these down into three types of control. Uh, so you can kind of see the manufacturers that support either of those. I think all of these will expand at some point. I think, you know, as we go farther along in this, we'll have a lot more consoles and a lot more processors that offer OSC. Uh, I think we'll certainly expand the plug-in count as well. Most of these manufacturers are in the process of making plug-ins uh, to be able to put on consoles to be able to take spatialization control from the surface itself. All right, let's uh, talk about our last one, which is three road lanes of audio transport. So how do we get audio from the console to these devices? And, uh, you know, there's not a ton of choices these, these days, but they're all very capable uh, choices, right? So in terms of audio networking, the primary sets are Dante and Milan, right? In terms of pure audio networking, those are probably the two most common methods I see getting audio to the actual spatializer. Uh, we also have multi-channel point-to-point digital, and that's primarily MADI. And we can see that MADI from a console to a, a spatializer, either via BNC or via fiber. Either one of those can, can handle it. And then, of course, uh, digital AES EBU, just single channels of, uh, of digital out to uh, the spatializer. So obviously we're talking, uh, well, I shouldn't say obviously, but right now we're talking about the potential for large numbers of channels needing to be transported to these devices, right? I mean, you might have upwards of 96, 128, maybe more channels that need to get spatialized, right? So those all need to emanate from the console. So let's, let's take a really quick look at uh, just kind of some signal flow here to see how this would work. So this is an example of a turnkey system. Uh, in a turnkey system, we have both a DSP spatializer and a speaker system and amplifier package all, uh, you know, maybe from the same manufacturer that are all optimized to work together. So the challenge at that point is, how do we get control of it? Well, we might have a remote computer that is in control of it uh, via browser uh, interface. Uh, we might have a plugin that is in control of it. We might have OSC on the console that is in control of that spatializer and dealing with all the objects uh, in terms of their placement and volume, right? In terms of how do we get audio to the spatializer? Uh, well, we have multi-channel MADI, Dante, and AVB, right? We can get AVB Milan. We can get any of those out of the console and uh, do these really high channel counts up to the spatializer, right? So that's the example of a turnkey system, probably the most streamlined of all of them that we're going to talk about here. Uh, the next one is a third-party spatializer. This would be, uh, Astral Spatial would be the great example here where, you know, you can go out to any speaker system that you choose. Uh, you have a similar aspect of control here where you can use a browser remote control. Uh, it, uh, as it sits right now, there's not many of the third-party spatializers that have plug-in control uh, available to them, although they are in development right now. Uh, in terms of audio transport, again, it's multi-channel MADI or Dante or Milan would be the preferred protocols to get audio up to the spatializer. How about a third party, uh, or I mean a uh, computer spatializer here. This is something like Flux and uh, Dolby Atmos, right? Where the computer is actually doing the spatializing. So then the question becomes, well, how do we get audio to the computer? and from the computer to the speaker system. So that's obviously gonna require additional IO devices. You're gonna choose your IO topology there and connect it to the computer via whatever connection scheme is dictated, whether it's you know, Thunderbolt, USB-C, blah, 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 whatever uh, the computer is set up to handle. And then it's a matter of uh, getting control of that. Obviously control-wise, uh, we're gonna be operating from the computer I know there, uh, I think Flux, now, maybe Hugo can address this. I know Flux now has the ability to control uh, elements inside the computer via OSC. So, you know, there's, a, there's multiple different ways to control there. Uh, I know with Dolby Atmos, you can, have a, you can have Dolby plugins available on your source audio to be able to control that as well. 
Uh, so, you know, these are all the kind of the challenges that you're going to run into in terms of system design, right? What is going to be right for me? Am I need, do I need to implement a turnkey system? Am I going to implement a third-party DSP? Or am I going to operate something like, uh, you know, a computer system that has I.O. attached to it? Those, for my money, those are the three main buckets that I see out there in terms of choice, right? Okay, so uh, that's kind of the setup for the next... Uh, lab, uh, which will be in two weeks, and we're going to dive in completely into object-oriented mixing, meaning uh, what are some of the mixing concepts for mixing back to spatialization? Uh, how do I handle it on the console? What does it make me do? Like, are, Is there any kind of compromises that need to take place in terms of what I do mix-wise back to these spatialized environments? I, you know, there's lots of questions to be asked and answered there, and you know, I, I think as an industry, we're still really, really early in this especially for mixing music. We're probably a lot farther along for mixing theater and uh, you know, even corporate events for what we're gonna do. But mixing music is a, a particular thing back into spatialization. So we'll talk about that next week or in two weeks, uh, how we wanna go there. So I'll open it up. Uh, it's been open for questions the whole time, but if anybody wants to jump in here and ask some questions and start some conversation here uh, regarding any of the stuff we talked about today or any of the stuff that's coming up in two weeks. Now is the time. Hugo, are you still in the room? Did you, uh, was I correct there? You guys are offering OSC control of uh, SPAT Revolution back through the computer? I don't know if he's still in or not. But... I am there. What did you say, Robert? Sorry. Oh, I was just asking, uh, did I see right that you guys are offering um, uh, OSC control of SPAT from yep, other yep. sources? It's all, yeah, SPAT's been, you know, all about OSC for the longest time. So third-party remote, you know, iOS remotes, obviously, you know, supporting consoles that do OSC as well. Right. And as you right. know, there's obviously a plugin specific to S6. So, but yeah, yeah, that's right. It's all around OSC. Yep. That's right. You guys had, I, I completely forgot this. You guys had iOS control of that as well. Is that right? That's, and you've had that for a long time. Well, yeah, the iOS is done, you know, with generic, you know, third party remotes being Limur and touch OSC and Shatang. But I mean, I would, I would actually say, I think that the exception would be Dolby. All players, you know, are revolving around OSC for integration. Yeah. You know, it's been kind of a de facto and given even add to the conversation that, uh, you know, integration with Elisa now is being done with something called ADM OSC, which I don't necessarily want to open the conversation, but it's kind <laughs> of a common grammar, a common grammar to get, you know, an object editor to talk to a third party renderer. So it's, it's exploding, you know, that, you know, that concept of, uh, you know, external renderer connecting to, uh, you know, products together. Uh, is an interesting uh, subject right now. Yeah, I, I think we've only, I mean, literally only touched the surface of it so far. I mean, where we're going to be in this yep. in four or five years, is going to be kind of mind blowing. I got a feeling so. So better to be prepared. Yeah, let's all get our start wrapping our heads around it now. Anybody else uh, got some comments, observations, anything you want to push discussion wise? Yeah, hey, Robert um, is Avid going to I guess maybe consider redesigning perhaps its output uh, bus topology to uh, better facilitate immersive type uh, mix flows. Uh, well, I'll just I'll I'll lay a little bit of the groundwork for a couple of weeks from now. I actually think we have great options for that uh, all existing today. Uh, I think the one place where SXL kind of uh, falls down a little bit is in OSC. I mean, we've, we kind of rely on plug-in control for control of the spatializer right now. I, I'm i all but certain that once development ramps back up at some point, we will we will certainly look at moving to OSC in conjunction with plug-in. Uh, but in terms of just being able to do the object-based, the bus-based mixing, et cetera, that you might want to do in object, I, I actually think we have some great options for that, and I'm going to cover those uh, in a couple of weeks here. So I would just respectfully ask you just to hang in there for that next lab. And we'll, we'll talk about all the options of, you know, do you want to be a discrete objects, you know, you want to be 96 discrete objects up, or do you want to do a combination of bus mixing plus objects? You know, we'll, we'll kind of lay the groundwork for that where it's very much like film mixing. Obviously, honestly, where a lot of film mixers 
will start with a 5.1 or a 7.1 or a 9.1 bed and then support it with objects. You know, it's much easier to manage uh, in terms of handling all these sources. And I, I think a similar mindset works uh, for music as well, especially for live uh, performance where you can, uh, you know, set up a primary bus and then support it with objects, you know. There's some give and take of it. Uh, it's I think over time it's probably going to drive some I, I, what I think are going to be fantastic workflows in terms of uh, you know linking compression and linking equalization across discrete outputs things like that you know that that's all development that's going to take place over the next next set of years once the demand for this really starts to happen. But it you definitely have to think differently. Uh, then if you're mixing to a left right bus it's just a different mentality uh, mixing to the to an immersive pa versus mixing to a stereo bus that's going to be distributed to a stereo pa system i mean you think different dynamically you think differently in terms of placement uh you know all kinds of things it just it, it just makes you think a little bit differently especially as you start to react to what you hear you know you, you will think differently than you did i mean think about i'll, I'll plant the seed here a little bit once you're mixing in immersive, what does stereo mean? What do stereo sources mean? What do stereo keyboards mean in immersive, right? How do I, what does that, what does actually actually mean in terms of placement in an immersive field? You know, so uh, same thing for stereo reverbs. What is a stereo reverb that we might use on a drum or, you know, even a vocal? What does that actually mean in an immersive field? Do we, do we, does it actually have relevance there now? Right, because you're gonna have to place that left and right output somewhere as an object in that immersive field. So, you know, there's a, there's certainly a line of thinking and I'm subscribing to it now that stereo, not, I won't call it irrelevant, but I have way less need for stereo versus mono spacing and spatial aspects than I did in stereo. You know, it's, it, it just becomes way more relevant now. So all kinds of things to think about there. That could end up being, that could end up being a two-parter on the next couple of labs as well. Once we start to talk about how to mix back to these uh, immersive speaker systems. So long-winded answer there, Winston. I hope that hope you got something from that. No, it, it just seems that uh, to really optimize uh, the spatialization or the object-based mixing, that that probably really needs to start back at the console um, to really take advantage of everything that that can give you. Yeah, I I mean, there's. It's almost like you got to train your mindset to think at least I think this way anyway, that stereo now feels like a limitation, right? I mean, with these immersive speaker systems, I mean, think about it now, we can create as big a soundscape as we want to make really with very little penalty. You know, there's not a whole lot of penalties going on in those soundscapes. Whereas in stereo, kind of the bigger we get, the more, more it kind of falls down in some areas, you know, it's Achilles heel really becomes apparent and, uh, you know, I said this in the previous lab, you know, that's that's where stereo really starts to fall apart a little bit for me is in these large scale stereo, you know, these large format stereo PA systems. In, in small format stereo, you know, home, theater, car, whatever, you know, those those Achilles heels are not there. They're not they're not as an apparent because of the spacing of the left and right signal. But you get into big PA system, those are problems, you know, they, they become a problem, become a challenge. And some of that kind of drifts away. Uh, with immersive and it doesn't necessarily solve it completely but it's a trade-off as i always try to say uh you know of impulse we're going to trade a little bit of impulse to get some some better frequency response slash acoustic phase of things but that, that in live sound especially large format that feels like a good trade to me so anybody else let me coming up yeah, we're almost an hour and a half again already boy these times go by quick on these things Whew. yeah I, I gotta say this has been interesting um when you guys were just talking about thinking of stereo versus immersive, I'm trying to wrap my head around that a little more. Yeah, yeah. Because that really is going to have to be a different way of looking at everything. It is. It is. You know, instead yeah. of you know, you don't pan your keyboards left, right. You know, and and I'm trying to think about the interface now. You know, you're so used to the left bus, left right stereo bus mix, left right stereo bus mix assignments. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and we're we're actually upgrading our theater right now, staying stereo, but. And I got to thinking in the, the smaller format, you know, we're doing with our upgrade, you know, everything is going to have an own amp channel now. So 
So I'm just trying to, and I know we're not going immersive. We're not getting the immersive processing and stuff like that. But I kind of think conceptually, is there some sort of middle ground that I can do with what I have now without going that far? Right. Well, you know, that was, honestly, that was kind of what drove my thinking back. If you think back to the, some of the slides where I had the, matter of fact, maybe I'll go back to it here real quickly. Is this guy, you know, I mean, this is really kind of a kind of a halfway ground, you know. I mean, you wouldn't necessarily need a spatializer to use right. this setup. Uh, do I think it would be well served by a spatializer? Yeah, I, I do. I actually think you could do it a little better with spatialized audio on the on the left, right monos, et cetera there. But this is kind of an in-between ground. I, I know Meyer is talking about uh, doing this kind of thing a lot where they're talking about spatialized LCR, you know, so... Uh, you know, this would be a good middle ground, you know, for somebody moving from stereo. You could kind of stair step it until you can get to your, a complete immersive system. So know? in this particular picture, are the how are you deriving the, the, the signals on the left, right mono um, wraparounds? Uh, well, in this situation, if I was spatializing it, I would probably do spatialized there, right? Spatialized okay. mono, right? Short of that, you could just drive it yeah. off of a mono bus uh, on the console, you know. I mean, it's going to mess with the imaging acoustically a little bit here for certain. I mean, that's one of the downsides to doing that distributed right. left, right. You know, as I pan left here, you know, depending on the amplitude of the offstage monos, you know, it may mess with my perception of what is happening in the left there. So, you know, you got to be a little bit careful there. And of uh, course, that it, oh, go ahead, sir. I was just going to say, but, you know, the LCR portion of it for the main throw of the room actually would be really effective here, I think. Yeah, and, and and again, that gets a little bit back to thinking beyond left-right panning too. That's right. You know, That's trying right. to think about the whole picture. Um, I mean, as a side note, uh, years ago there was this little theater outside of Buffalo, the theater in the round that I started working in. You know, we did the left-right, you know, each section, um, but it was a constant battle because the stage spun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so as the stage moved, you were you were, you know, it wasn't just mixing a PA, you were, you know. Oh yeah, I, I we have a know, venue yeah, here in Arizona. The back or the front or the yeah. sides or, you know, I mean like a Fender Twin had spin around and I mean. Yeah, we got, was, we got a venue here in Arizona called the Celebrity <laughs> Theater that it has that exact problem. I mean, it's it's a mono PA system flowing around the stage. But, you know, when there are, when there are loud rock bands sitting on that stage spinning around in circles, man. It's a, oh, yeah. it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting thing for sure. But it was a lot of fun too. I mean, don't get me wrong. It, it yeah. really made for an interesting environment. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, I, in terms of the object mixing though, I, uh, part of what I was getting at earlier when I was referencing churches who, ha, you, know, you know, who a lot of times don't have the most experienced people behind the console, you know, taking away busing off of the console now where if I turn up a fader, you know, that direct output is an object showing up in the immersive speaker system, right? So it's just fader up, I hear it. Fader down, I don't hear it. There's no, there's way less sense of gain structure because there's uh -huh. no stat, you know, staggered busing. There's no serial busing going on. There's no master bus, you know, uh, in other than maybe VCA control, which is just an overall volume control, a remote control of the elements I've got assigned to it. Right. Right now, the hardest thing I'm, I'm envisioning is, and I guess, again, it's getting stuck, I think, in the old left-right concept of, you know, when you assign something and turn it up, how do you tell it, like, where to go? Or how does it know where to go spatially in the room? I guess the interface is what's kind of confusing me at yeah. this point. You you, you'll know? see that in the next segment, but just, to, just okay. to give you an example of it, you don't have a pan knob anymore. Right. You would have a positioning knob. Okay. Right? So... Uh, and I'll, I'll use S6L as the example because I got it sitting right here. So uh, for every channel, you would have a plug-in that is a remote control of the spatializer. Huh. Right? And it would only address that object, that fader that you're working with. So you can position it front to back, left to right for that channel on the console. Okay. I mean, right? it, it's 
similar to the panning concept that's just taking more dimensions and putting more dimensions into play. That, that's uh, that's in, in partially true, right? Because the thing you have to remember in stereo, and we'll, we'll address this in the next uh, session, is you know there's a down point for stereo, right? When something is in the center, it's either 2 dB, 3 dB, 5 dB down, right? right? There's no sense of that here, right? You're huh. just placing it left to right because there's no summation really going on here anywhere, right? Between... Okay. Right. So, uh, but the cool thing about spatialization that we'll show next week as well is that there is a depth control as well, right? You can push it farther away and it'll actually use a reverb engine to create that sen sense of farther away, closer to me, right? So you, you do have a second dimension there to place. You have left to right and front to back. Interesting. This sounds exciting. It, it really is. And I, I mean, it's, it, I, the times that I've mixed on it, I just thought, oh my gosh, man. This is just going to make live sound mixing so much more fun now, you know. I mean, you just yeah, the options of what you can do are just so dramatically improved. So, so we'll cover all of that. We'll cover all of that in the next one. I'll actually pull up some front field immersive mixing that we're going to play around with a little bit. We'll talk about stereo right. uh, versus mono for effects, for instruments, all kinds of things of kind of how to deal with these and... We'll all learn a little bit together because this is new for everybody. I'm still still wrapping my head around it, but having some fun doing it. I got an immersive speaker system here that I can kind of pull up and practice with. So oh, that's uh, I'll share I'll share everything I've learned. That's for sure. Okay, let me get out of this. Stop sharing here so we can quit staring at that. And there I kind of am. There we go. All right, guys. Well, I hope uh, you got something out of this today. You know, it was kind of nice to be able to have Scott in here again. Hopefully, he'll come back even for the next one. Uh, and uh, I can have him, you know, actually even show us some more stuff on the Elisa Spatializer. Uh, I hope to do more of this over time. Uh, I have plans to do, you know, back through some of these other systems as well. I, 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 uh, Scott has been generous enough to give me an Elisa Spatializer here. Uh, to be able to mix back through. We did some presentations for NAM. if any of you guys saw those things. So this will be kind of an extension of that. Uh, and then I hope to do some more with Flux, uh, maybe the DMB, possibly uh, even the Meyer uh, uh, SpaceMap Pro, maybe, uh, or SpaceMap Go, I should say. Uh, try to get back through that and kind of look at all these different spatializers and see how they're handling it. Uh, so we'll dig into that in the lab as, we, as time allows, okay? All right. Uh, anybody got anything else you want to add before we close out here? All right. On that note, I will let you guys all go. We will see you in two weeks for the next one that is completely focused on object-oriented mixing. Scott, thank you so much for showing up and contributing. Very appreciated. Same to you, Hugo. Thank you for showing up. If you're still in the room, I appreciate you contributing there. I am, man. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And we'll see you guys in a couple of weeks. Take care. Be safe out there. Stay warm. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Take care and thank you.